Good morning. It is Wednesday, the 30th of August. It is 10.50 in the morning, and I'm doing a video today on ancient Egypt. That should be pretty short and to the point for you guys. Uh, first of all, I got this, this image here of ancient Egypt, and this kind of shows you where the ancient Egyptian culture is going to be based and founded. And you'll see down the middle of it is a river. That's the Nile River. Um, it is the longest river in the world. It flows from the mountains of Africa north to the Mediterranean Sea. And this is going to be the lifeblood of ancient Egypt. It was very easy to um, predict the floods. And whenever the river flooded, it would bring nutrients and soil, and it would make the area around the, the river be fertile again. The Nile River is also going to be used as a transportation source, a food source, and it's even going to be used for papyrus, which is basically paper. When you look at ancient Egypt, you break it down into a couple different things. You break it down into the pre-dynastic period, the old, the new, the middle kingdoms, and then um, you know, modern times as well. Now, our dates are just going to be estimations for this class. The dates are good enough. So pre-dynastic Egypt is basically 3500 to 2800 BC. And during this time, there are different kingdoms. There's the upper kingdom and the lower kingdom. And Egypt is going to kind of get its feet wet and become a thing. Um, the Egyptian culture is going to be created and the way of life is going to be created. Uh, the Egyptians are going to explore along the river. And finally, somewhere around 3100 BC, this guy named Menes or Narmer is going to unite the two kingdoms together and we get our first Egyptian dynasty. We used to think that Narmer was legendary, but recently, in probably the last 15 years or so, um, evidence of Narmer's existence has been proven. After that, we come to the Old Kingdom, which lasts basically 2800 to 2100 BC. And Egypt is going to be led by kings. Now, they're not pharaohs, they're just kings. And these kings are going to be absolute monarchs, so they're very powerful. They're not gods or anything like that. That happens later. But they are uh, absolute rulers. The entire economy of the kingdom is based on on a royal monopoly. They do everything for the king. All the peasants work for the king, the slaves work for the king, the artisans work for the king. Uh, all the food is brought to the king and then the king gives it back out to other people. Uh, the old kingdom is also going to trade with some neighbors, uh, the kingdom of Nubia, the, the um, people of the Mesopotamian areas, and um, all of this is going to be done under the name of the king. Now, if you want a really good idea of how powerful these kings were, all you have to do is look at the pyramids. The great pyramids of Giza were temples and also burial sites for Egyptian kings. The largest pyramid is the tomb of Khufu. And it's said that it took 100,000 men more than 20 years to build the Great Temple of Khufu, or the Great Pyramid of Khufu. It's estimated that there are 2.3 million blocks, and each of those weighs about 2.5 tons, which puts that at something like 3,000 pounds each block. Uh, scientists and historians, archaeologists, are not even sure how they were built. Um, there's a suggestion that they were lifted into place with like a, a lever pulley system, but then there's also some evidence of ramps on the inside so that it may have been rolled up and pushed into place. Whatever it was, we don't know. But these are going to be sandstone buildings, and they still stand the test of time, and they used to actually glow uh, very brightly in the sunlight because they had like a, a coating on them that has since worn away. Uh, this is a video of Josh Gates, the host of Exhibition Unknown, uncovering an e Egyptian tomb. Uh, if you are interested in this PowerPoint, just send me an email with all these videos and, and 
embedded and then you can watch it there as well. But for our purposes, to keep this short and interesting, I will skip it. Uh, Egyptian religion is polytheistic. It's based on the circle of life. And by that, I really mean the circular idea of nature. Um, I've got listed some of the most important gods there. Some of you may have heard of them, some maybe not. Uh, most people have heard of Ra, Amun, Osiris, Horus, uh, Anubis maybe. And each of these gods has a story or a legend that follows them. Um, there are lesser gods than that, um, but these are the primary gods. Um, the Egyptians believed in an afterlife, and they saw afterlife as a reward. And in their afterlife, they would get bigger and better and most more important. And it was also believed that they would physically reanimate their body when they got to the afterlife. And because of that, the Egyptian bodies are going to be preserved and mummified and embalmed. Uh, the tombs are going to be filled with anything that they might need in their, their next life. And there are statues put into the tombs to protect or that the spirits could embody and take over. Now, how do you uh, know what to do for the burial practices? There's a book that was very important in Egyptian culture called the Book of the Dead. And the Book of the Dead uh, told the Egyptians how to mummify, how to handle the remains, and even for the spirits, how to defeat any sort of obstacle they may come into to contact with on their way to the afterlife. Another thing that I'm going to put under religion is the idea of mat or mat. Uh, sometimes there's an apostrophe between the two A's. Uh, mat existed if everything was in the right order. It's like this cosmic balancing or this, this cosmic harmonizing force where if everything is done right and if everybody is working together, then everybody will profit and everybody will succeed. Um, in reality, the kings would use this as a way to keep people under his control, or in a few cases, her control. Ancient Egyptian writing is often what people think of when they think of old world writing, and Egyptians developed hieroglyphics. Uh, we can actually read hieroglyphics thanks to the discovery of the Rosetta Stone by Napoleon and the French in 1798. And the Rosetta Stone had three different things on it. It had um, hieroglyphics, it had ancient Greek, and it had kind of like a mix between the two. And by translating the Greek and then figuring out how the Greek compared to the Greek hieroglyphic mix, eventually researchers were able to, to um, translate hieroglyphics. And so today, ancient Egyptian writing can be read. Now, it's interesting because it has different parts to it. It has the phonograms, ideograms, and determinatives. Uh, the phonograms are signs that represent sounds. So, for example, an oval, it can represent the letter R in English. An ideogram is an idea. So that same oval, it doesn't just stand for the word or the letter R, it also stands for a mouth. So that's the ideogram. Now, how do you know if it's the phonogram or the ideogram? Uh, there are these unspoken things called determinatives, basically punctuation. And depending what that punctuation says or is, will determine if you're looking at the letter R or the idea of mouth. The other interesting thing you should know about ancient Egyptian writing, there's actually no consonants that are written. There are images that are meant to like represent consonants, but they didn't specifically have consonants, or vowels, I mean, in their, their writing. So vowels did not exist, consonants do. Ancient Egyptian writing is very much focused on the idea of myth and religion and afterlife. The Egyptians also like to write about proverbs and war victories and just their everyday life and what they did and didn't do. 
When it comes to math and science and medicine, the Egyptians were at the forefront of that. They used applied science all the time. Through their mastery of things like geometry and surveying, they were able to control floodwaters. The pyramids were perfect shapes geometrically. And uh, the medicine, while very much still being about driving demons out of the body, they at least took time to think about medicine. And they performed a form of triage where they they would assess you and figure out, you know, do you have a curable disease? Do you have a disease that we just need to treat long term? Or do we just need to make you comfortable and, and rest until the end comes? And believe it or not, they were able to diagnose and treat 48 different medical problems that are recognized and treated today. Now eventually the Old Kingdom will end. Um, there's civil war, there's a lack of food, and uh, the Middle Kingdom is going to be kind of like a transition. From about 2000 to 1720, the Middle Kingdom is going to exist. And there's not a whole lot to know about it other than um, it's Mentuhotep II, who's the founder of the Middle Kingdom who declares that pharaohs are living gods. So it's Mentuhotep that makes that change. Uh, the Middle Kingdom is going to end in the year 1720 because there's this group of people known as the Hyksos that invade. Uh, we don't know where the Hyksos came from. We don't know much about their origins. And we also don't know what happens to them. What we do know is they used horses, bows, and arrows. They came in, they took over the Middle Kingdom around 1720, and by 1570, the, the Hyksos or Hyksos have been defeated by the Egyptians, and they are forced out of Egyptian territory. Once the Egyptians take over again, that's the beginning of the New Kingdom. Now, the New Kingdom lasts for just about 500 years, or really 400 years, if you want to be a little closer to correct. And the pharaohs of the New Kingdom are viewed as gods. Uh, Amos the first is going to be the one who f drives the final knife into the Hyksos. Uh, he's going to be the establisher of the New Kingdom. There's going to be a pharaoh named Amunhotep who will build the great Karnak of, or the great temple of Karnak. Uh, Tutmos the first builds the Valley of the Kings. Tutmos the second marries his wife who also is his sister through some weird chance of fate, Hatshepsut. Uh, Hatshepsut is going to overthrow her stepson once Thutmose II dies, and she is going to pretend to be a living god, she's going to pretend to be a man, and she is going to wear a false beard on her face because that was the symbol of a pharaoh. Eventually, Hatshepsut will have the kingdom taken away by her stepson, Thutmose III, and Tutmos III is going to attempt to destroy any and all record of his mother, Hatshepsut, which is why today in 2022, 2023, 2024, whatever it might be, uh, that we are still learning more and more and more about Hatshepsut. Eventually, one of the pharaohs, Amenhotep IV is going to declare a new religion, and this is going to be a monotheistic religion, meaning there's only one god instead of multiple gods. This new god is going to be Aton, and the founder, Amenhotep IV, of this religion is going to change his name to Akhenaten. Now, if you're curious what Akhenaten means, it means one who serves Aton. And not only is he going to change the whole system of gods, he's also going to move the capital to a place called Amarna. Because when he moves it to Armana, he can get rid of the priest, he can start over, and he can be the one that is in true control. Well, this is a big change. He changes the religion, he changes the way of life, he moves the capital, and there are some people who just can't handle that. So Amenhotep IV, or Akhenaten, as he's known at this point, is going to be murdered in the palace and then kicked outside the palace to, to kind of stay there. Once Akhenaten is murdered in this palace coup, um, his relative, King Tut, takes over, 
and it basically undoes everything that Amenhotep IV did. The religion is going to go back to the way it was. Uh, the city of Amarna is going to be, to be uh, basically abandoned, if you will. Now, if you're curious why he moved the capital to Amarna, uh, it's because, number one, it's a brand new city. He could do whatever he wanted with a religion. But number two, it was on the east side of the capital, which to the Egyptians represented the idea of eternal life. Now, King Tut, like I said, King Tut's going to undo everything that Amenhotep does. Let's skip this. Um, very quickly, I want to mention the ancient Phoenicians because they're somewhat related to this. Uh, the ancient Phoenicians are going to live north of ancient Egypt. They basically live in what is today Syria and um, Lebanon. They're very skilled traders, very skilled ocean farers, and they're going to set colonies out all over the place. One of the colonies they settle is a place called Carthage. And Carthage will be important when we get to ancient Rome. The last thing is they invent this color called Tyrian purple. It's supposed to be a purple that is can be not matched anywhere, and it becomes the uh, the purple color becomes the symbol of of monarchy and power. Um, also, the Phoenicians are going to be conquered quite a few times. They're going to have a rough go of it. All right, so why am I telling you about them? Well, it's because the Phoenicians give us our alphabet today. Uh, Phoenicia is very close to the word phonics, and the word phonics comes from the word Phoenicia. Uh, they developed a system of writing that had 22 letters, all consonants, no vowels. Uh, no vowels. Uh, it's supposed to be a redux or a redo of Egyptian hieroglyphics that's easier for the Phoenicians to understand. And eventually, this Phoenician alphabet will become the Greek alphabet. The Greek alphabet will be shared by the Roman alphabet. And then eventually, you get to the alphabet that we have today. Uh, so it's just of interest to you guys that that is where our modern day alphabet gets its start, is with the Phoenicians who rewrite Egyptian hieroglyphics. All right, this one is short. It's under 20 minutes. I want to say thank you for joining. And if you have any questions about anything, you know, please send me an email. I appreciate hearing from you. And I did hear from some of you this week, so that was very nice. Thank you very much. And um, hope you have a great weekend or great week or whatever it is when you watch this. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.